Good evening. Welcome back to the evening service of Ferntregully Independent Baptist Church. We are going to continue our survey through the book of the prophet Isaiah. And as you can see, uh, we've entitled this uh, series, The Judgment and Restoration of Israel. And uh, we're certainly looking at uh, how the way that God was going to judge Israel, but not just Israel, but other nations as well. And uh, chapters 13 to 27, we began looking at last time, um, contain the prophecies against the nations. These are the nations which surround the country of Judah. And chapters 13 to 23 have been labeled the Book of Burdens because of the repeated use of the word burden to describe the message that God delivered to Isaiah. These burdens were not delivered to the nations to whom they were addressed, but really to the people of Judah. Now, the purpose of these prophecies included, we saw last time, uh, number one, to proclaim the Lord's authority over the Gentile powers, to preserve Judah from despair when oppressed, to predict the eventual downfall of all the Gentile powers, and to prevent Judah from forming an alliance with these very nations, and finally, uh, to produce faith in mankind. And these are all uh, the reasons why God gave these prophetic burdens to Isaiah to pass on to the people of Judah. And the nations to be judged, uh, you can see on the map here, and the list uh, next to it, and we've already... Uh, address the first three burdens uh, to Babylon and Assyria, uh, the Philistines and the Moabites. And we're going to continue to look at the remaining prophetic burdens given to Isaiah. Now, remember in these lessons, we're mainly, mainly looking at what Isaiah taught. And so application is going to be limited. If we were preaching through this, we would take shorter portions and and uh, include more application, but we're just teaching through this particular book. Now, I would encourage you to go over the chapters that we look at and meditate on the applicational truths that they contain. And uh, the one main issue in these chapters is going to be uh, the need for uh, Judah, the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem to trust in the Lord and not form alliances with the surrounding nations. Now, in our last study, we finished by looking at Isaiah's burden against Moab in chapters 15 and 16. And so now we continue with the judgment against Syria and Israel in chapter 14. Now, Isaiah's next burden is directed towards Damascus and Ephraim, Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel are grouped together in this prophecy because they had formed an alliance in 735 to 732 BC. And we saw that all the way back uh, in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah went to King Ahaz uh, and told him not to make an alliance with Assyria against these two nations that were threatening him. Now from verse 4 onwards of chapter 17, the prophecy seems to focus more on Israel. And Damascus was the capital of one of the great nations of antiquity. It was common for an entire nation to be referred to by the name of its leading city. And in the same way, Israel is called Ephraim after its most prominent tribe. Let's read chapter 17 verses 1 to 3. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, Isaiah predicted the fall of Damascus. It would cease being a city and instead would become a ruinous heap. The fortress of Ephraim, probably a reference to the city of Samaria, uh, 
would also cease to exist, we're told in verse 3. Their alliance failed just as Isaiah had predicted back in chapter 7. Now, this prophecy was fulfilled in 732 BC when Tiglath-Pileser III killed Rezin, the king of Syria, and destroyed Damascus and Syria's other cities. And the phrase there in verse 2, the cities of Aurora, are the towns and villages south of Damascus. Now, it's interesting that an inscription uh, found by archaeologists in Nineveh describes Tiglath-Pileser's defeat of Syria. Listen to, uh, or let me read what, what, uh, the, what was found uh, there in the ruins of Nineveh. Uh, it says, speaking of Tiglath-Pileser, I laid siege to and conquered the, the town of Hadara and inherited property of Rezin of Damascus, the place where he was born. I brought away as prisoners 800 of its inhabitants with their possessions. Uh, he continues, their large and small cattle, 750 prisoners from Kurusa, prisoners from Irma, 550 prisoners from Matuna, I brought also away. 592 towns of the 16 districts of the country of Damascus I destroyed, making them look like hills of ruined cities over which the flood had swept. Very uh, telling, isn't it? And it's really in keeping with the prophecy that Isaiah gave over Syria. Everything he said came to pass. And so turning to Israel or Ephraim, and we notice there uh, that uh, in verse 4, uh, Isaiah speaks of Jacob. Uh, Isaiah compared the extent of the destruction of Israel or Ephraim to a human body wasting away. In verse 4, he speaks of the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. So his, his healthy looking flesh will become, uh, you know, emaciated. He likened the nation or the, the, the uh, city of Ephraim or the uh, city of Samaria and, and Israel to a field uh, that had already been harvested in verse 5, as when the harvestman gather, gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm. And also to an olive tree plick, picked clean, except for a few uh, olives on the high branches that can't be reached. Verse 6, it says, an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bough. And so that's how uh, the nation of Israel will be, basically uh, a shadow of, of what it once was. And then we find in verses 7 to 8 that we have a prophecy about that day. Uh, at that day, that's the day of judgment, we're told that a remnant that has escaped the enemy will turn to their maker, the Holy One of Israel. Let's read verses 7 and 8 of chapter 17. At that day shall a man look at his maker, and his eye shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his, his fingers have made, neither the groves nor the images. Now the phrase, at that day, often looks forward to the future tribulation period, and it may be referring to that time because the generic man is used here, and that day a man shall look to his maker. And, uh, and also, uh, but we, so we, we think that this could be very much a, a prophecy of double reference. It has reference to the immediate future of Syria and Israel's devastation, but also looks forward to the tribulation. Uh, we're told, as we just read in verse 8, that they will forsake their altars that they've made with their hands and will no longer respect or look with favor on the groves or the images, the idols that they have made. The groves refers to the fertility cult of the pagan goddess Ashtaroth or Astart, a popular false god the Jewish people regularly turn to when they turned away from the Lord. Now the reason for the destruction is that Israel forgot their God and tried to secure their future independently of him. Let's read verses 10 to 11. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant uh, 
pleasant plants, and shalt set it with strange slips. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish. But the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. So the description of sowing plants in these verses refers to the pagan worship customs, rather than trusting in the God of their salvation and their rock of strength in times past. The Israelites had planted seedlings of faith in foreign idols, and the harvest from such plants, he says at the end of verse 11, would be grief and desperate sorrow. Well, verses 12 to 14 pronounces God's woe on the Assyrian nation for the destruction that they will inflict upon Syria and Israel. And the Assyrian army was made up of people from many conquered nationalities, and hence they are likened in verse 12 to a multitude which make a noise like the noise of the seas and like the rushing of mighty waters. It describes a cacophony of different languages all speaking at once. When Assyria finished its work as God's rod of judgment, then it too would be judged. And that is what we saw back in chapter 10, verse 16, and verses 33 to 34. God was using the nation of Assyria to judge not just Judah and Israel, but also the wicked surrounding nations. But once their purpose was complete, they would also feel the rod of God's chastisement. And we find that God shall rebuke them and cause them to flee in fright. Let's read verses 13 and 14. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind, the rolling things like a tumbleweed before the whirlwind. And be, behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. And so the nation of Assyria, as we saw back in chapter 10, were going to do a lot of damage and uh, you know, cap take captives of the nation of Israel and Judah, and destroy and take plunder. And this is what they were doing. And God is now pronouncing here in these verses 12 to 14, his judgment on Assyria. And verse 14 reveals that uh, that they will be destroyed in one night. Look at that again. Behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. And this total destruction of the, of the armies of Assyria was fulfilled when the angel of the Lord destroyed 185 Assyrian soldiers as they besieged Jerusalem. And you can read about that in 2 Kings 19, 35 to 36 in Isaiah chapter 37 verses 36 to 37 and we've mentioned that already in our studies a number of times but God's punishment came upon the nation here well I want us to notice that of course Isaiah was speaking to the nation of Israel about idolatry they had forsaken God and they had joined themselves to idols but idolatry is not just an issue in countries where Worshippers still bow down to images. Anything we place above God can become an idol, even good things. Christian idolatry today is not just manifested in the pursuit of wealth, possessions, or pleasure. Our idols are often more subtle than mere things. They include the love for human approval or recognition, the desire for comfort, the desire for love, uh, or, lo or the love of control or having your own way. So the things we fear more than God are our idols. Do we fear death more than God? Do we fear pain, rejection, or ridicule more than God? And what we seek as our priority in life often indicates what we worship. Where do you go for refuge in stressful times? What we put our trust in is a signpost revealing our idols. Idolatry is ultimately a delusion a delusional worship of something inferior in place of the Almighty. When looked at in these terms, we are just as much idolaters as the person bowing down to a little idol in Asia or Africa. And we need to take that into account, beloved. 
we can read this uh, d- uh, this description of God's judgment upon Israel and uh, and the reason for that that they turn to idols and and we can just completely dismiss our own idolatry. But beloved, we need to examine our own heart in these matters. And so this is the judgment against Syria and Israel. But Isaiah next turned his attention to the nations south of Israel. And in chapter 18, his prophecy centers upon Ethiopia, which in the Hebrew is literally the word Cush, meaning black. Cush included what is modern South Egypt or Southern Egypt, Sudan, and the northern parts of present Ethiopia. And the nation that we know of as Ethiopia in the Bible is often called Abyssinia. So this is talking more about uh, what would be termed in secular history and archaeology as the Nubians, uh, the people of Sudan and southern Egypt. And around the, the time of this prophecy, all of Egypt was actually under the control of an Ethiopian king. And the prophecy against Ethiopia starts with the pronouncement of woe in verse 18. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And the um, that announcement of woe is a strong threat of impending catastrophe, although no specific word of judgment is pronounced until chapter 20 and verse 4. Now, we find that ambassadors from Ethiopia are seen traveling down the Nile River in boats made of bulrushes. Let's read verse 2. They're talking about the the Ethiopians that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning he, he, uh, hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled or literally have divided. And uh, we know that uh, the, this land of Sudan and, and northern Ethiopia, we know that the Nile River divides in two there. We have the Blue Nile and the White Nile. And that's what uh, he's referring to here when he talks of there, the, the uh, um, being, uh, uh, having the rivers ha- were spoiled or, or divided. Now, um, they, these ambassadors are described as a, uh, coming from a nation scattered and peeled, which literally means tall and smooth, probably referring to being smooth-skinned and clean-shaven, unlike the Jews and other Semitic people who often had beards and, and were quite hairy. So this is a good description of the people of Sudan and Ethiopia. They are tall and very smooth people. They were also considered a terrible people, that is, they were fearsome warriors with a reputation of being a mighty and destructive nation. That's the literal meaning of a nation meted out and trodden down. Now, these ambassadors um, have come to Judah in order to make an alliance with them against Assyria. And at the times when Judah rebelled against Assyria, she often relied upon Ethiopia and Egypt for protection. You can see a reference to that in Isaiah 37 verse 9. Now, the phrase, go ye swift messengers, most commentators believe that comes from the mouth of Isaiah himself. And so he's telling the ambassadors to return home because there is no need for an alliance between Ethiopia and and Judah. And in verses 3 to 6, Isaiah is told the Lord will act against Assyria according to his own time. And when it happens, he will prune the branches of the Assyrian army. Verse 5 says, let's read verses 5 uh, to 7. For a four, saying before the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away the cut down and cut down the branches they shall be left together unto the fowls of the mountains and to the beasts of the earth and the fowls shall summer upon them and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them in that time shall the present be brought unto the lord of hosts of or by a people scattered and peeled and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto 
a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have divided. And notice this, this present brought to the Lord, and it's brought to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. And so, uh, beloved, they uh, will be, we're told here that when the Lord acts against uh, the Assyrians, that they will be left upon the mountains as food for wild birds and beasts. And verse 7 looks forward to the future when the Ethiopians will come to Mount Zion, offering gifts to God rather than brandishing weapons. So it's a testimony that this people will one day be worshippers of God. And we've seen that. There was a reference, if you recall, last time to the Moabites uh, coming under the, the jurisdiction of the Lord. And we see it here and we'll see it also in the very next uh, prophetic burden against Egypt. And that's the very next a nation that Isaiah deals with in chapter 19 to the end of chapter 20. And I want us to notice first in chapter 19 verses 1 to 15 that Egypt is condemned. And Israel has had a long history with Egypt, of course. It varied from being enslaved and oppressed at the time of Moses to becoming Israel's ally against Assyria during the days of King Hezekiah. And here in chapter 19 and later in chapter chapters 30 to 31, Isaiah warned Judah against making an alliance with Egypt. Isaiah prophesied that God would come in judgment against Egypt, riding on a storm cloud in chapter 19, verse 1. He, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And so the Lord coming uh, on that cloud, and as in the days of Exodus, God would judge the idols of Egypt. All right, the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. The heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. So he would begin by bringing civil war against them. Verse 2 says, Egyptians against Egyptians. And they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor. City against city, kingdom against kingdom. And, and God will, will not just bring a civil war against them, but uh, all the things that they put their trust in, the false gods and the, the idols there, the occult practices in verse 3, the charmers, the familiar spirits and the wizards, we're told at the end of verse 3 that they will fail and the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst of thee. I will destroy the counsel thereof. Uh, the idols there, the charmers and those things that I just mentioned. So the Lord would send cruel lords and a fierce king to rule over them, a reference to the kings of Assyria in chapter, uh, sorry, in verse 4. And after, uh, the, uh, after 740 BC, as uh, one commentator says, one Assyrian king after another defeated Egypt on the battlefield. And so Egypt was... Uh, was subjected to uh, the wrath of the Lord, the judgment of God through the Assyrian nations. Now, verses 5 to 10 predict that the life-giving Nile River, which itself was regarded as a god, shall fail and be dried up. The resultant drought will cause great calamity for Egypt's agriculture, fishing, and textile industries. Look at verses 7 to 9. The paper reeds by the brooks, that's the bulrushes, the reeds by the river, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brooks, that's the fishermen with the, with the uh, you know, fishing rods, shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax and they that weave networks shall be confounded. And so God judging them by bringing this drought upon the river Nile and then obviously upon the nation which depended upon it. And verses 11 to 15 put the blame at the feet of the leaders of Egypt. The world famous wise counselors of Egypt who were meant to guide Pharaoh had become brutish or foolish. Let's look at verse 11. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The princes of Zoan would be referring to uh, the priests of the particular gods that they worshipped. The princes of Zoan are fools. Uh, 
the counsel of wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Verse 13, the princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. They have also de seduced Egypt, even they that are the stay of the tribes thereof. All right, so the cornerstone of the nation, these wise men really come to nothing. So the Lord actually brought confusion or what he calls there in verses 14 and 15, a perverse spirit to the minds of the leaders so that nothing they attempted, no, no work would succeed. Look at verses 14 and 15. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work whereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. Neither shall there be any work for Egypt, which the head or the tail, branch or rush may do. So like shameful drunks, they will stagger about, not knowing what direction to take in their counsel against uh, the Assyrians. Now, the implication of all of this is, why rely upon Egypt when they don't know what they're doing? If they are unable to solve their own problems, how could they possibly help anyone else? And so uh, the believer who looks to the world for their counsel will end up receiving similar confused and misguided advice. And we should heed the words of the Methodist preacher Samuel Chadwick. He says, Confusion and impotence are the inevitable results when the wisdom and resources of the world are substituted for the presence and power of the Spirit. So the first place any Christian should go for wisdom and understanding is to the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 Chapter 9, verse 10 tells us that the beginning of knowledge and wisdom is the fear of God. So the first 15 verses describe Egypt being condemned, but the latter part of verse 19 speaks of Egypt converted. So the Lord also revealed that Egypt's imminent destruction will one day turn to salvation in the future. That would occur in that day. It's mentioned six times in this passage here, verse 16, verse 18, verse 19, verse 21, and then verses 23 and 24. So that day is a reference to the day of the Lord in the end times. After the pressures of the tribulation period, Egypt will acknowledge the Lord and will join with Israel in worshipping him. And we're told in verse 19 that an altar will be raised up in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar will be erected at the border thereof to the Lord. The altar and pillar will be a for a sign and a witness. Verse 20 says that the Egyptians are worshippers of Jehovah the Lord. Look at verse um, 20. And it shall be for a sign and a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And so verse 21 says, and the Lord shall be known in Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and they shall do sacrifice and oblation. So when Egypt is confronted by oppressors in the second half of verse 20, they will cry to God who shall send them a savior, a great one to deliver them. So even Assyria will experience salvation and join in worshiping the Lord with Israel and Egypt. Look at verse 23 down to verse 25. We'll start from the middle of verse 23. And they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians in that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. What a wonderful picture is portrayed here. In the future days, after the millennial period, there will be a remnant of believers from both the Assyrian nation, which today we could generally class as the Kurdish people, 
uh, around that northern part of of um, Iraq and, and and going over into uh, Turkey, modern Turkey today, and and along with the Egyptians and the people of Israel, they will be worshiping the Lord. Now, uh, Mocha, the commentator, points out that there that there are five indicators of the Egyptians' conversion. Number one, there was reconciliation with God as pictured by the altar in verses 19 and 20. The place of sacrifice is the place where sinners are reconciled to a holy God. And the altar will be a sign and a witness of their reconciled standing before God. During the millennium kingdom, sacrifices will be performed as memorials of Jesus' great sacrificial work and never as a means to gaining salvation. Secondly, the Egyptians will engage in prayer to the Lord. They will call out to him, indicating that they are on speaking terms with the Lord in the second half of verse 20. And as Mocha says, they are to be brought into living fellowship with the Lord and find that prayer is the effective way of dealing with life's problems. And that's what we need to learn as well. And thirdly, the Egyptians will receive the revelation of, God, of the Lord himself with the result that they shall know the Lord, verse 21 says. True religion is not people searching for God, but people responding to revealed truth. And fourthly, the Egyptians shall serve the Lord publicly through sacrifices and oblations. Oblations are free will offerings. And then they will serve the Lord personally by commitment. Uh, they will be committed to performing or keeping the vows that they make to the Lord. And finally, the Egyptians will also experience God's discipline when they stray. When the Lord shall smite Egypt in correction, he will also see to it that he shall heal them when they repent or when they return to the Lord. And we're reminded that whom the Lord loveth, he, he uh, correcteth. Proverbs 3.12 tells us that. So what a marvelous section, this last part of, of chapter 19 of Isaiah is the conversion of Israel in the future day of the Lord. But 20, chapter 20 continues with the prophecy about uh, Egypt, and it tells us about e Egypt's inability to save. So chapter 20 re reiterates the fact that Egypt will be unable to save Judah from the Assyrians. Isaiah is instructed to be here a visual lesson to the nations of Judah, Egypt, and Ethiopia that resisting the Assyrians will be futile. And this action took place, look at verse 1, in the year that Tartan came into Ashdod and fought against Ashdod and took it. Now, the word Tartan, the noun Tartan, was a title, not a name. It was a title of the commander of Assyria's army. Sargon sent his uh, uh, army to defeat the Philistine city of Ashdod in the year 711 BC. Three years earlier, God commanded Isaiah to dramatize what would happen to those who rebelled against Assyria. And so he was uh, instructed to remove his sackcloth garment which was a sign of mourning over sin, and his sandals. And in verse 2, notice there, he was to walk around barefoot and naked, or naked and barefoot. Most believe that this required Isaiah to remove his outer garment, not his loincloth uh, undergarment. But Isaiah's actions are symbolic of the way the Egyptian and Ethiopian people will be led captive to Assyria, naked and humiliated. Let's read verses two to four of chapter twenty. At the time, uh, at the same time, spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, "Go and loose the sackcloth from thy from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot." And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, "Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked." and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Now, 
this is, of course, the, the idea of being led away naked and humiliated is uh, naked and uh, barefoot is is speaking about their shame or the humiliation of of their their defeat here and so i the lord through isaiah is is saying that anyone who looked to egypt for support against assyria as judah had been tempted to do will be uh, defeated and demoralized like the egyptians and the ethiopians and you know this is yet another reminder in the book of Isaiah about the foolishness of relying upon human resources. As we mentioned before, the things we trust in over God have a habit of failing us. This, of course, is by God's design. All our trust and confidence should be in the Lord. And that is, again, something that is repeated time and time again. Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6 remind us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, acknowledge the Lord, and he shall direct thy paths. And this is what God is trying to teach the nation of Judah, and he's trying to teach us also through Isaiah. All right, let's continue then with the next uh, word of judgment. And we find here more judgment for Babylon in chapter 21, verses 1 to 10. Now, this is the next prophetic burden, and it's, we find it's directed towards the desert of the sea, which is only fully identified in verse 9 as Babylon. The term desert of or by the sea was given to Babylon because of its proximity to the Persian Gulf. God's judgment is predicted to come upon Babylon like a whirlwind blowing in from the hot deserts of the south. And we see that in verse 1. Now Isaiah's vision of Babylon's destruction is explained as being grievous or so severe or intense that it filled him with pain and caused him to be bowed down like that of a woman in the process of giving birth. Let's read verses 3 to 4. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. So his heart trembles and is terrified. That's literally the meaning of fearfulness affrighted me in verse 4. His heart trembles and is terrified about what he sees. So he's not able to find a peaceful rest at night. And the instruments of God's judgment are spelled out in verse 2 as being the nations of Elam and Media. A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media. All the sighing thereof have I made to cease. Now this prophecy refers to one of two possible attacks. The first is to the Assyrians' defeat and destruction of Babylon in 689 by Sennacherib, uh, or it refers to the Medo-Persians' capture of Babylon in 539 BC under Cyrus's command. Now in both cases, Elam and Media were allies with the principal invaders. The problem in pinpointing a date is that Babylon was besieged a number of times in the lifetime of Isaiah. So the Assyrians went back because Babylon was such a rebellious uh, a city. They went back a number of times in 710 BC, 702, 689 and 648 uh, because of their continued rebellion. And so they had to deal with that. Uh, so uh, the most likely fulfillment of this prophecy is the destruction caused by Sennacherib in 689 BC. The other prophecies in the section of the book fit the Assyrian Empire in Isaiah's day. Now in verse 9, the watchman who saw the approaching army announced Babylon's impending doom. Verse 9, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath he broken into the ground and that phrase is fallen is fallen is 
is talking, uh, saying here that the this destruction is assured and it will be complete. And it's interesting that the same phrase is quoted about the Babylon of the tribulation times in Revelation 14 verse 4 and chapter 8 verse 2. And their references to Babylon's ultimate destruction. Now, history records that Sennacherib not only destroyed the city, but all of its idols and shrines. An inscription from Nineveh portrays uh, Sennacherib's destruction. He says, I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire. The wall and the outer wall, temples and gods, temple towers of brick and earth, as many as there were, I raised and dumped them into the Aruta Canal. Through the midst of the city, I dug canals. I flooded the site with water, that in days to come, the site of that city and its temples and gods might not be remembered. I completely blotted it out with floods of water and made it like a meadow. I removed the dust of Babylon for presents to be sent to the most distant peoples. And that is really, again, in keeping what God said would happen to uh, the nation here, that their, all of their graven images and their idols uh, will be destroyed. And, and uh, certainly uh, Sennacherib did that at the hand of the Lord. So in verse 10, Isaiah leaves no doubt that God is the source of his vision. He says, O oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. So the next prophecy turns against the nation of Edom, or as it's called here, Duma. And we only have two verses uh, directed towards this nation, two short verses. Let's read verses 11 and 12. The burden of Duma. He, the, he uh, calleth me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, return, come. So uh, the uh, name Duma is derived from Edom's Assyrian name, which is referred to as Udumu. The name Seir in scripture refers to the mountainous region south of the Dead Sea occupied by the Edomites. So the Assyrians will put uh, the Assyrians put down at least three revolts by Edom during the years uh, 337 to 701 BC. Isaiah, as the prophetic watchman, was asked about the duration of the night, a symbolic of dark, a symbol of darkness and oppression. Could the prophet see any sign of coming light uh, or deliverance? So his reply. Uh, was that he could see the morning cometh and also the night in verse 12. In other words, there would be a short-lived time of freedom that would be followed by yet another night of oppression. It likely means that the oppression uh, came uh, by the, uh, or that the oppression by the Assyrians will be replaced by another oppressive nation, that of Babylon. So we turn from the Edomites now to the uh, judgment against Arabia. In chapter 21, verses 13 to 17, Assyria's control of the Near East extended down to the Arabian Peninsula. The uh, the um, the, pro the prophetic burden uh, um, made by uh, Isaiah is, is for against Arabia is not good. So the picture is of the Arabians in full retreat from uh, the grievous war, and then Isaiah predicted that within a year, God would destroy the glory of the Arabian city Kedar. Look at verses 16 to 17. For thus saith the Lord, uh, for thus hath the Lord said unto me, within a year, according to the years of an hireling, and all the glory of Kedar shall fall or fail. And the residue of the number of archers, the mighty men of, of the children of Kedar shall be diminished for the Lord of God, Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. So only a remnant of the Arabian fighters would survive their conflict with the Assyrians. And so this is another warning to the inhabitants of Judah not to trust in any political schemes or alliances. Now we come to 
the judgment against Jerusalem in chapter 22. Uh, a list of the judgments against evil and corrupt nations like Babylon, Assyria, the Philistines and Egypt. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's ultimately it's disturbing to see that J J um, Jerusalem is included in this as well. And the reason becomes evident in the passage. Jerusalem is spiritually like her surrounding foreign neighbors because her citizens acted like the heathen then she must also fate, uh, share the fate of the heathen. And so chapter 22, verses 1 to 5, um, speak about the mistimed rejoicing. So the subject of this burden is the valley of vision. Uh, verse 22, the burden of the valley of vision. So that's a reference to Jerusalem because it was surrounded by valleys on three sides. And when you get to verse 9 and 10, you, you realize they're talking about Jerusalem because it's called there, uh, you know, uh, the city of David. And in verse 10, he's talking about the houses of Jerusalem. So we're definitely talking about Jerusalem. So something had caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to be stirred up or tumultuous and joyous, verse 2 says, uh, that, that they're full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Some suggest the city was rejoicing over the lifting of Sennacherib's siege, of Jerusalem in 701 BC. Whatever it was, their rejoicing was untimely because judgment was about to descend in the form of a siege. People would die in the siege, but not with the sword or in battle, the end of verse 2 says. It is a reference to people dying of starvation in the city. Now, the rulers of Jerusalem seek to flee the city to save themselves, but they are bound or captured by archers and all the inhabitants verse 3 says will be uh, taken prisoner now isaiah's words were literally fulfilled when the babylonians uh, um, uh, when the babylonians uh, besieged jerusalem uh, and uh, judah's last king zedekiah and his remaining army sneaked out of the city at night but they were pursued and they were captured in the plains around Jericho. And so the Babylons killed Zedekiah's two sons before his eyes and then blinded him and carried him off in shackles to Babylon. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 25 and verses 1 to 7. Well, the next part of chapter 22 speaks of their misplaced trust. Although the Lord had decreed a day of destruction upon his people, uh, they will not acknowledge him or respond with repentance. Instead, they attempt to prepare for conflict by trusting in their own preparations and their own might. And we see that in verses 16 to 14. When the invading forces do come, the valleys surrounding Jerusalem will be full of chariots and horsemen. Look at verse 7. And it shall come to pass that thy choicest valleys shall be full of chariots and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. The people of Jerusalem might think that they are secure behind their high walls, but they do not realize that God has discovered or removed his protective covering from Judah. Verse 8, And he discovered uh, there, uh, or removed the covering of Judah, and thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. So, uh, the Lord is normally a rock or a fortress, a high tower to those who trust in him, Psalm 18 verse 2 says. But he also promised that his protection uh, would be removed when his people forsake him. For instance, turn with me, uh, if you have uh, your Bible with you, to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 25 to 26. And Deuteronomy 28 is, a, is part of the covenant that Israel made with, Jude, uh, with God as they entered into the promised land after the Exodus. And God promised that if they would obey his word, there would be blessing. But if they disobeyed, then there would be a curse upon them. And this is part of what God said would happen when they forsake him. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 25, The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. 
and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, and thy carcass shall be meat unto the, all the fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away, or scare them off from you. Ultimately, the inhabitants of Jerusalem put their trust in human resources rather than the Lord, and Isaiah revealed that uh, they uh, put their uh, uh, reveals the measures that they took to protect themselves, and they put their trust in their armor or their weapons that were stored in the house of the forest. That's Solomon's armory, uh, which the Bible says elsewhere was made of cedar beams. That's what what's, it's referring to, the house of the forest. And then they also repaired the breaches or the broken down parts of the walls in verse 9. And they demolished some houses in verse 10, the houses of Jerusalem, to fortify the wall, it says. Then they stored up water from the lower pool and a, a new um, reservoir was built. That's what the ditch is speaking about to collect more water. Some believe that this refers to the tunnel that Hezekiah carved out of solid rock that carried water from the Gihon Spring. Uh, Second Chronicles 32 verse 30 speaks of that. Now there is essentially nothing wrong with these preparations for war, but by relying on these things, they forgot their primary defense. The last part of verse 11, ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. The commentator Oswald says, If it is true that God is the sovereign of the universe, then our first task in a moment of crisis is to be sure that all is clear between him and ourselves. Then other preparations, if necessary, can follow. Now, these people were making preparations, but they'd forgot about getting back to following the Lord in his ways and, and uh, walking with him in joy. Now, verse 13 starts that uh, with the word behold. Oh, sorry, ra I've missed the point here. Rather than preparing Jerusalem for a siege, God called on Jerusalem's inhabitants to humble their hearts and repent with weeping mourning with baldness and girding on of sackcloth. These are all uh, things to do with mourning over sin or the death of someone. And so this is what God is saying. You should be repenting. And these are the signs of repentance. Now, verse 13 starts with behold. It says there, and behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. And so this behold is an exclamation of surprise at Jerusalem's opposite reaction. They reacted with joy and gladness instead of sorrow and grief at their sin. And so this section ends with a harsh word of condemnation from the Lord. The Lord would not forgive their unbelief and their stubborn refusal to turn to him. Look at verse 14. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, the chapter continues by speaking about also the misguided leadership that Israel had that were leading them to make seriously wrong decisions. And uh, so we see that in the final part of chapter 2, verses 15 to 25. And Isaiah is commanded to confront Shebna, he is called the treasurer, or he's a high-ranking official in Hezekiah's court. Verse 15, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even to Shebna, which is over the house. So he's like the prime minister of the nation. Verse 16, And say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here, as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. So Isaiah meets him at the sepulchre or the tomb that he's hewing out for himself and rebukes him for his pride and abuse of office. Shebna is thinking of the glory of his name instead of guiding God's people through perilous times. He wants to construct a monument to his own glory and perpetuity. He wants to make a, 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 a wonderful tomb for himself that would speak to generations to come. 
and the reality is that this was this was a man who was who was not appreciating the troubles of the time he was oblivious to them and his personal pride overshadowed his concern for the welfare of the nation and the lord promised that he would be that he would drive him from his station in verse 9 and look at verse 18 he would toss him like a ball into a distant land where he would die verse 18 the first part of that verse tells us that now in his place the lord would raise up eliakim a godly man who would have a greater concern for the people of jerusalem he is called my servant by the lord because of his faithfulness to god let's read verses 20 to 22 and it shall come to pass in that day that i will call my servant eliakim the son of hilkiah and i will clothe him with thy robe that's shebna's robe so he'll take shebna's place and strengthen him with thy girdle and i will commit thy government into his hand and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of jerusalem and to the house of judah and the key of the house of david will i lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open and so god would reward him with power and control that's what the word the or the term key of of the house of david means in verse 22 and in verse 23 the lord promises to establish him firmly in his position like a nail fastened to a wall now the burden uh, uh, to jerusalem ends with a warning though in verse 25 let's read verses 24 and 25 and they shall hang upon him so verse uh, 23 speaks of him being a nail or a peg in a wall and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house the offspring of the issue all vessels of small quantity uh, from the vessels of cups even to the vessels of flagons in that day saith the lord of hosts shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the lord hath spoken it now verse 25 taken together with verse 24 seems to be a warning about again again about misplaced trust eliakim was only a man and it was unwise to put your trust in him uh, who, um, and because if you do uh, even though he was wise and capable those hopes would certainly be crushed and it's a reminder that the lord alone is sufficient to be trusted in no matter how good a person may be he or she will eventually let you down and as it has been said even the best of man is only man at best now this note of caution concerning Eliakim is another reminder uh, to Isaiah or in the book of Isaiah to stop trusting in man. Now 2,700 years later nothing has changed. Christians still have the propensity to trust in other sources than the Lord. Often our first response to problems is to think about what we can do to solve it. Our second response is to think about who we can go to for help. And only after these things are exhausted do we, do we finally turn to the Lord. And we should always go to the Lord first, trusting his leading and his timing. All right, now we continue with the very last um, nation to be judged or to be uh, spoken against, and that is the nation of Tyre in chapter 23. So the final prophetic burden is pronounced against Tyre, and also its sister city sidon both these phoenician cities were great maritime powers of the ancient world and their ships brought them great wealth from all over the mediterranean sea tyre was considered the babylon of the sea and it is appropriate that tyre closes this series of burdens against the nations the commentator barry webb states that as babylon was proverbial for its military might and cultural achievements tyre was proverbial for its commercial wealth standing in the first and last position as they do then babylon and tyre sum up all that is impressive and alluring in the world and so the prophecies start with babylon and end with tyre because both these nations are suggestive of of the world and and how alluring the world can be 
So the various places, when you read chapter 23, that traded with Tyre and Sidon, they're mentioned here as Tarshish, probably speaking about Spain and Chittim, which is um, uh, Cyprus and Egypt. Uh, they are commanded to howl as the news of Tyre's total destruction reaches them. And that word howl is found in verses 1, 6 and 14. For instance, the burden of Tyre, verse 1, howl ye ships of Tarshish. And verse 6, they're told there, pass ye over to Tarshish, howl ye inhabitants of the isles. And again, verse 14, howl ye ships of Tarshish. And so the destruction of Tyre would deal a serious blow to the economies of the Mediterranean nations that relied upon Tyre. Now, the wealth and grandeur of Tyre is described in this passage. For instance, in verse 3, uh, Tyre, it speaks of Tyre's revenue uh, and the fact that she is a mart or a marketplace of the nations. All the nations brought their wares to Tyre to trade and to, to gain, and Tyre became wealthy from that. And so Tyre's glory also lay in the fact that its antiquity is of ancient days, the verse, verse 7 tells us. And verse 8 says that she was known as the crowning city. And by Isaiah's time, the city of Tyre was more than 2,000 years old. Now, in verse 8, it's merchants uh, and are princes. Uh, it says there are princes, and they're ruling not by their political power, but by commercial might. Its traffickers or traders are the honorable of the earth. That is, they gain great glory through their trading activities. And yet all of this wealth and grandeur would come to an end. Look at verse 1. The burden of Tyre, howl, ye ships of Tarshish, for it, shall, uh, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Shittim. It is revealed to them. So as t sailors from Tarshish approached Tyre, they would see that the houses of the city were laid waste and their ships were obstructed from entering into her port. And in verse 5, Egypt, we're told, shall be sorely pained by the report of Tyre's destruction. Well, what, uh, you know, what is going to bring uh, this destruction? Uh, or what can dis explain the demise of such a great and glorious city? Well, Isaiah reveals the reason for Tyre's downfall was the plan of the Lord. Verse 9 says he has purposed its destruction in order to stain the pride of Tyre's glory. Look at verse 9. The Lord of hosts hath purposed it to stain the pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. So the Lord was going to humble the great pride that followed from their success. And he was going to bring into contempt, or literally, he was going to dishonor all the honorable of the earth. That's a reference to Tyre's distinguished merchants. And so wealth and ability to accomplish great things are a gift from God. And pride in human uh, glory is a denial, ultimately, of God's existence, or at least his help. It ignores God as the true source of strength and all achievement. Pride is essentially a self-centered rather than God-centered perspective on life. The only legitimate source of boasting is in God, as the prophet Isaiah reminds us in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he hath understanding and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And the Apostle Paul reiterates that because he, I think he even quotes from this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 131. He says, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Well, God's instrument of the destruction of Tyre was first to be the nation of Assyria, followed by Babylon, and finally Greece. And Alexander the Great scraped the city into the sea in 332 BC, leaving it uninhabitable. 
And here Isaiah is pr probably referring to Assyria's actions against Tyre because he states that Assyria had already done to the Chaldeans what the prophet foretold it would do to Tyre. Look at verse 13. Behold, the land of the Chaldeans, that's Babylon, this people was not till the Assyrians founded it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers thereof and raised up the palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. So what they did to Babylon, they would do to Assyria. Now, despite um, Isaiah, or Tyre's destruction, Isaiah also foretold its future restoration in verses 15 to 18. After being forgotten for 70 years, the Lord will allow Tyre to rebuild her economy. Verse 15, And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years, according to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as a harlot. So she'll sing once again as a harlot, Verse 17 says, and she'll commit fornication with the kingdoms of the earth. That's a figurative way of describing Tyre, resuming her role as the commercial prostitute of the nations. But in her case, uh, her merchandise or it, her profit will be holiness or be set apart to the Lord and be, be, and be given to benefit those who dwell in the Lord's presence. Look at verse 18, the last verse of this passage and her merchandise, that's her profit, and her hire shall be holiness, shall be set apart to the Lord. It shall be for not be treasure nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. And so this verse looks beyond the history of ancient Tyre to the future when God will transform the um the the hearts and the the uh, and cause the gentiles to come and worship him and in isaiah chapter 60 verses 5 to 9 we have another reference to that we've already spoken about that in chapter 2 but look here in isaiah 60 verse 5 we'll read this verse and and then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear uh, that's talking about be awed, overawed, and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they uh, uh, from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and in incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Jump down to verse 9. Surely the isles shall wait for me, uh, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord of the, uh, the Lord thy God, and the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And so Tyre, along with the uh, other many other nations, Gentile nations will unite to fulfill God's glorification of Israel. And this is talking about, I believe, the millennial period uh, when these believing nations, the believers within these Gentile nations will, will come, as we saw in chapter 2, will come and worship the Lord and be taught of the Lord himself. Now, this is a glorious ending here. And uh, yet it reminds us again that the nations need the Lord. And we're told uh, to, to go unto the uttermost parts of the earth with the gospel. And uh, we don't know how these people will be saved. Uh, they'll be saved, no doubt, in the tribulation period, and they'll continue on uh, into the millennial period. But uh, the reality is there will be saved people who will glorify the Lord in the millennial period and also give, uh, give um, their glory uh, and the wealth of their nations to Israel. And that will be part of the, the blessings that God promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Well, uh, the commentator John Oswald summarizes the intent of this entire section of the burdens against the nations. Listen to what he says here. He says, chapters 13 to 23 seem to be saying that since the glory of the nations, chapters 13 and 14, equals nothing, and since the scheming of the nations, 14 to 18, equals nothing, 
And since the vision of this nation, chapters 21 and 22, equals nothing, and since the wealth of the nations, chapter 3, equals nothing, then don't trust the nations. The same is true today, he says. If we believe that a system of alliances can save us, we have failed to learn the lessons of Isaiah and of history. God alone is our refuge and strength. And let me close uh, this evening with Psalm chapter 46, verse 2. These are verses we use to encourage our own hearts at the start of the coronavirus. It's the picture that we have, the verse that we have uh, that you can see every Sunday morning as we preach. But it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? And I trust that we would learn this truth, that God is truly our strength and uh, he is our help in trouble. And though the world is uh, seems to be in chaos around us, we know that God is in control and he can be our source of strength, our source of uh, comfort in these troubling times. And so thank you again for your attention. I trust that it was a blessing to go through these chapters, although we've gone through them very quickly. But it's important for us to understand the the theme of what Isaiah is trying to get across to the nation here uh, of Judah. And so let's close in a word of prayer and and I trust you have a, a, a glorious evening and that you continue to think on these truths. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the book of Isaiah and the prophet Isaiah and Lord, the words that you gave to him, the faithfulness of his preaching and his uh, Lord uh, revealing your truth to people who were stubborn, uh, people who, Father, had turned their back on you. Help us, Lord, not to be stubborn. Help us not to be worldly. Help us not to have idols in our life that rob you of true worship and true glory. Father, we pray that you would help us to turn to you and learn the lesson that Isaiah's generation needed to learn, that you alone are our refuge and strength. Father, we pray that even tonight we would continue to think on these things and that you would, uh, Lord, uh, bless this message to our hearts and uh, help us to learn from it and be transformed by it, not for our glory, but for yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.